We are in uh, Dorohusk on the Ukrainian-Polish border. It's about 330 miles west of uh, Kiev. And just to give you an idea of our surroundings at the moment, behind me, that's the Ukrainian side. That is where uh, things start off quite uh, quiet in the morning. And then we were here late last night, and th this place was surrounded with people, with families, children, uh, particularly men, uh, particularly women. And I'll come to that in just a moment, coming through with children. Uh, and they were being, way uh, over here is where they were being collected by various various people. There were buses lined up all along the road and uh, various vehicles and then people were standing here and then staring across the border waiting. And some of them have been waiting here for hours in fact. There's one gentleman don't know where he is right now, a Lithuanian guy uh, that we were speaking to, lovely chap, and he'd driven all the way here to help his uh, brother-in-law's friend, and he stayed in the car overnight, and his his friend who went across the border to meet her husband and her kids, she couldn't get back because they were saying that the border was closed, so she's had to sleep in a car with the kids and her husband uh, overnight. Her husband won't be able to come through because he is uh, aged between 18 to 60, and if you're a Ukrainian guy and you get to the border and you're aged 18 to 60, they basically send you back to fight. They give you a piece of paper and then you have to enlist uh, to fight. So anyone of that age is being sent back to fight uh, and mostly women and children coming through, through in fact according to the UN three quarters of the people that are crossing the border, not just at this crossing, this is one of 11, uh, one of 11 crossings between Poland and Ukraine, but uh, the vast majority are women with children, and then after that you have foreign nationals, students at universities in places like Central Asia, uh, from North Africa as well, they're coming through, and then you've also got double refugees, some people who fled uh, war in places like Afghanistan, persecution in places like Iraq and Iran, etc. They've then come to settle in Ukraine, and then they've had to flee war again and they're what we call double refugees. I mean, the people of Poland have been uh, astonishingly generous, actually. They've welcomed people with open arms. But I just wonder how they feel themselves about almost bringing the war into their country. Is there fear? A little bit of fear. There's a little bit of fear, a little bit of apprehension, because, of course, we are very close to Lviv in the West, and the Russians haven't approached the West yet. They've been uh, attacking Ukraine from the south, from the east, uh, and from the north. But at some point, they are going to turn their way towards Lviv, because this is really the western part of Ukraine uh, on the other side. is really the only supply route in. So from, from a tactical point of view, at some point, Vladimir Putin is going, going to turn his attention west, uh, west. We're told it's quiet in Lviv over the border, but uh, undoubtedly the Russians are coming. And when that happens, a lot more people are going to across the border and the tension here is going to rise. We were talking about how much the Polish authorities are doing. And let's just quickly show you, there's a, there's a Polish humanitarian tent here. They're selling all sorts of, I say selling, they're giving away all sorts of uh, things, you know, sweets here. You've got uh, clothes over there in the corner. And then if we come over here, there's a kind of uh, family area where, uh, like, people can sit. You can see there's some families waiting there. And then if we, if we walk down the road just here, there's someone giving away uh, coffee and tea here. There's a little stall set up. This was full of people last night. And then you've got some portaloos that have sprang up by the side of the road. And then another humanitarian tent. And then some people here who've brought their camping equipment. Perhaps these people uh, haven't had anyone to collect them at the border to take them anywhere. So they're just waiting uh, for, their, for their applications to be processed by the authorities. So this all sprang up in a week. Right, and the numbers at the moment from the Polish government, 672,500 coming across the border from Ukraine. Just to give you an idea of how big that figure is, uh, that is half the number of people who applied for asylum in Europe during the 2015 refugee crisis, and we're 10 days into this conflict. So it is easily going to surpass that in the next week or so, especially as the, uh, as the, the, the Russians shelling of uh, Kyiv intensifies, and this is one of the main routes into Kiev, incidentally. So what's going to happen, Paul, for the longer term? Because obviously there's been talk about bringing some refugees to the UK, but obviously with these numbers of people, they can't stay in Poland if this spreads out into a longer term invasion. No, absolutely. They're going to have to go somewhere, and Poland can't be expected to house all of them, and that is why there is some criticism of the government scheme that it needs to be opened up to Ukrainians who do not have any connection to the UK. At the moment, you have to have some sort of connection. You have to know someone or be related to someone, rather, who is living 
uh, in the UK and Europe at the moment, they have agreed to, to take in millions and millions of Ukrainians um, for up to three years, visa-free. Uh, some countries are enacting legislation to give them certain rights that will make them equivalent to EU citizens. So the scheme is much more generous in the EU than it is to the UK, and that's why the UK government's uh, getting, getting uh, s some criticism that it still isn't going far enough uh, at the moment.